I go fire ahead if I am already late. Perfect. Let's go for it. Thanks, Liz. Good morning. So good morning. I'm Liz Wishka. I'm one of the PEDS ID consultants here at St. Mary's Hospital. And I'm just going to talk a little bit today about COVID-19 um, and this emerging hyperinflammatory syndrome that we've described over the last couple of months, which we've given the catchy name of PIMS, but the rather unwieldy name of Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome Temporarily Associated with SARS-CoV-2. Um, we're going to stick with PIMS for today. Um, and... Um, uh, so I'll just, I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 in children and the impact that it's had uh, locally and globally um, about this emerging phenomenon and how we've characterized it and some of the differences that we've identified to Kawasaki, which is a similar but overlapping condition, and then talk briefly about some potential mechanisms. Um, so I don't think I need to remind anyone, I think we're all quite familiar with SARS-CoV-2, which is a coronavirus, um, and we have had previous coronavirus outbreaks with MERS in the Middle East and SARS um, in 2004, which was a problem mainly in Asia, but also in Canada. Um, and these are all beta coronaviruses. And this is slightly relevant because there has previously been an alpha coronavirus, NL63, which has been implicated in Kawasaki disease, although there's a lot of debates in the literature and the community about how true that is. Um, and so we know that the 2003 outbreak uh, probably came from bats and civets um, and the outbreak from MERS in 2012, which we still see cases from from time to time, um, is probably predominantly in camels. Um, and people have talked about this poor little animal pangolin for our current outbreak, or maybe bats, which is not why we called one of the observational studies we're doing after it. Um, and we know a bit about coronaviruses um, that have caused severe outbreaks in adults um, in children. So we know that it's quite uncommon uh, for kids to be severely affected by these beta coronaviruses. So SARS-CoV-1 um, saw a really low number of pediatric cases in the total of 8,000, which now seems like a tiny number, but at the time was pretty horrifying. Um, and they all had a relatively mild course that resolved within a week. Um, but as you get older into the, the adolescent stage, you become more adult-like. Um, and similarly from MERS-CoV-2, uh, very low numbers of pediatric cases, majority being asymptomatic. Um, and the very early data that we got from China uh, would, uh, was very reassuring for us as pediatricians, suggesting that this was likely to be the same uh, for this new virus, this uh, SARS-CoV-2. So um, this very first report showed that, that less than 1% of all cases were in children under 14, and 92% of them had quite mild disease. There were no fatalities in that original 72,000 cases reported. Um, and this is uh, a paper that's looking at the data in Europe um, internationally, but just I've highlighted in red here the UK data showing that the risk of death um, in children is extremely low due to coronaviruses, um, which is very reassuring. And it just actually compares them to the deaths due to other causes um, and demonstrating that actually this isn't a huge threat to children. Um, this is the early data that was published in June from ISERIC, which is the international um, study uh, which is in coordination with WHO trying to characterize um, and gather data on the outbreak um, and just showing here that um, the number of children affected is very low. Um, as you can see, the young children, very few admitted or who died. Very interestingly, the comorbidities that have actually been implicated are all about metabolic disease. And this is possibly relevant for the pathogenesis and may have relevance for PIM. So patients with chronic cardiac disease and diabetes and lung disease, um, and then some with neurology, but that may just be age-related, um, seem to have a worse outcome. Um, and there is a question about the blood vessels of patients with these diseases and whether there is a relationship between your endothelial and pathogenesis of this virus and then uh, I just I put this in from because I really like this figure showing um, clustering of syndromes um, and so people so there are lots of, pretty much it's like everything in the viral world any virus can cause anything but if you get different phenotypes of disease that seem to cluster together so you get people who have um, more kind of neurological and and bleeding disorders. There's a gastro subset here. This is the one that people are most familiar with, which is the um, difficulty breathing and the lung involvement. Um, but there is also this chronic COVID fatigue syndrome that seems to be emerging, causing joint pain and myalgia and fatigue. Um, and it's quite interesting to try and think about where our syndrome might fit if we were to do this. And obviously, because um, we had much more time on our hands than the adults, there's been a lot of publications 
but not just in the paediatric literature on, on the impact in kids. And interestingly, the Australians obviously had lots of time because they did quite a few. Um, and this is just showing the prevalence of COVID-19 in children in a variety of countries. And I've just highlighted Africa because it, it looks like there's very low prevalence, but this probably reflects the um, lack of testing and recognition in children and this is particularly relevant given that the population of Africa has such a young population so we would anticipate that they would have a greater proportion of impact in children and then in New Zealand where they've been able to test everyone it looks like 10% of cases occur in children under 19 and um, but this will include much more symptomatic this is much more likely to include children with severe disease so this reflects capacity as well as epidemiology so it's probably not a true reflection of what's happening. And this is the UK data showing that um, children under 20 account for about 5% of cases in the UK in April and May. And I haven't checked the June data yet, but I should update that slide. Um, and I just put this in because there's been so much discussion about schools. So this is a really good review, the Ligora review, if you just want to have a look through it. But um, it really suggests that the majority of children who pick up COVID-19 get it from their parents or exposed from within the family group rather than in other environments. Um, which is also reassuring from a transmission perspective. Um, this paper went on to show that uh, unlike adults, where about 15% have severe disease, only about 2% of children get severe disease with COVID-19 um, and that the presentations are quite different. So adults have a really classic presentation with fever, cough and difficulty breathing, whereas there's a broader spread and fewer proportions of children presenting with those symptoms, um, which is unhelpful for those of us who work in accident and emergency because it's much harder to pick out the kids who present with COVID. In fact, many of them are actually coincidentally positive rather than presenting because of it. Um, and along with that, what's been interesting is that adults have had a very classic laboratory picture having lymphopenia and high CRP. So these are very inflamed, quite unwell patients um, and 56% having abnormal radiology. Whereas in kids, we just hadn't been seeing that pattern at all in those who presented with COVID-19 disease. Um, and what I think everyone will recognise who's been working is that there has a higher proportion of infants under the age of three months presenting with severe disease. And this may be a couple of things. Uh, it may be uh, an increased susceptibility in that age group. We know that generally these babies are more vulnerable due to their immunity um, and their airways and things like that. Um, and it may also reflect that parents are more likely to bring infants of that age into hospital. Um, but also I know that we've had in young infants in our intensive care unit who had COVID-19, but actually were probably admitted because one child had severe enterovirus and another child had a heart defect. So there may be some skewing of the data here. Um, but again, these infants under three months are different again in the way they present to older children and difficulty breathing was more common in this age group and that hasn't really been explored. The numbers are actually still quite small. Um, and again, the lab findings in kids, in, in young infants, uh, um, bizarrely, were more like the adults, so they were more likely to have a picture significant um, to COVID-19 disease. And so a number of papers have been published looking at the severe forms of COVID-19, but all reassuringly low numbers and low of deaths and presentations and very few comorbidities. This is data from Picanet in the UK, but also um, there's a JAMA paper, which is quite nice to have a look at, um, showing that um, uh, we are seeing a very little amount of ECMO compared to the adults, a very low death rate. Again, it's the same number as in the other paper, about 50% of children needing inotropes and very little renal replacement therapy, which was really common in the adults who required support for COVID-19 disease. So very reassuring. Um, then it leads to lots of questions about why is the disease not so severe and I think we need to then just think about how it causes infection. So SARS-CoV-2 binds to this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, ACE2, um, and you know this because of um, blood pressure treatments um, and uh, because uh, um, uh, and we know that children have lower proportions of ACE2 expression than adults do. Um, and we also know that the uh, virus can affect organs other than the respiratory system and this is really reflecting where ACE2 is expressed. Um, and so we've seen presentations in the literature um, from all parts of the body, including relevantly for the PIMS, the, the heart and the gut causing diarrhea. Um, and this is just a figure from this paper in Nature Reviews Immunology showing that the virus here is entering the cells uh, through the ACE2 receptor and this TMPRSS2 receptor. Um, it comes in, it replicates, and then it triggers an immune response. 
um, you, which involves T cells, macrophages, the usual suspects, um, and interferon gamma, and probably type 1 interferons as well, to trigger a variety of chemokines and pro-inflammatory factors. And in, in, the, in a healthy immune response, or in what we would think what's happening in children, um, there are neutralizing antibodies, which bind and activate the virus. The alveolar macrophages prompt apoptosis of the cell, so the virus doesn't get released to infect other cells. Um, and CD4 and CD8 T cells um, efficiently eliminate any infected cells as well, working with the macrophages. But unfortunately, what seems to happen in that proportion of patients who have severe disease is that this doesn't happen, that there's increased vascular permeability secondary to a massive inflammatory storm, and that all of these chemokines get increased in, in high numbers. Um, and some people have um, suggested that it's a non-neutralizing antibody causing antibody-dependent enhancement of infection. And this is something that people recognize in the second episode of dengue that you might have heard of. And it is one of the things that's suggested as a possible um, uh, cause of PIMS too as well. PIMS, <laughs> just PIMS, <laughs> only one PIMS. Um, and we know that there's a difference. So this is just a nice picture from this paper showing the differences of what's happening in the lung in adults with COVID-19 and in, in children with COVID-19. And again, there are differences in the expression of these receptors I just told you about. But also children generally, um, particularly younger children, because they can be more pro-inflammatory, often have higher levels of regulatory T cells and increased immune modulation, which may have a dampening effect on those pro-inflammatory cytokines, which seem to be really crucial. And the thing that's quite interesting when I, I showed you earlier of the comorbidities and the cardiovascular risk factors is that in patients who've got cardiovascular disease, their endothelial cells are already inflamed and already possibly predisposed to produce some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines um, and the barriers in their lungs are already affected. Whereas in young children who have healthy endothelium, this is less likely um, to be a problem. And so this is, these are some of the reasons that it's thought that children are less likely to have severe disease. Um, and so it's just summarized here. Um, that all of this is hypothesis driven. And just, um, I think I wanted to really just highlight briefly that for children, the, the problem hasn't been severe COVID-19 disease, but actually all the other impacts of lockdown um, and that they have faced a number of risks and um, including domestic violence and unemployment, poverty, child abuse um, and education. And this is, um, and also there was a, a concern during lockdown delayed presentation to A&E. This is a paper from the Lancet from an Italian group who just looked at uh, A&E presentations in over 2018 and 2019 and in a similar time period compared to 2020 in orange. And you can just see really low presentations during the lockdown in, in Italy. And they identified 12 cases of delayed access that had really severe outcomes, six children ending up in intensive care, and unfortunately four deaths just to this one case report. Um, we, uh, I think, saw quite a bit of DKA in our setting here at Mary's. They saw two children with um, leukemia who presented late, and we've seen a number of malignancies, um, but also just sepsis um, and seizures and things like that. Um, and so this has been a real concern for us, um, leading to changes in the messaging for families about coming to A&E, which I think has had a good out, um, impact. Um, and then just the impact on education. So across the globe, 188 countries um, closed schools affecting one and a half billion children. Um, and there are, there's lots of data about uh, snow days and um, summer holidays. So we know that children forget about 25% of what they learned over the long summer holidays. Um, but at least in a normal summer holiday, they might be getting to do other things that have some educational benefit. Whereas being locked in your home for three months um, has limited benefit. And then in particular, um, if you are poor, because better off families um, have finances and computers and can sign up for museum tours and have motivation to do things. So it's about 30% worse for poor families. Um, and although two thirds of countries that close schools introduced learning platforms, this was much lower in low income countries. And we already knew that the, the young people across the world were digitally excluded because of access to laptops and computers generally and Wi-Fi. So this has made a massive impact on educational inequality. All our playgrounds are closed. I've just, I didn't tell you, but obesity is a great risk factor for severe disease and minimizing the uh, ability of children to go out and play is only going to contribute to the obesity pa um, pandemic that's ongoing and then just the impact on poverty so we think that the number of households that will be tipped into a severe poverty is going to go up by 106 million this is data from unicef 
Um, and this is the number of children who normally get a free meal at school who are missing that when schools are closed. But also there are many people for whom basic hand hygiene, which we're purporting to be really important for preventing transmission is impossible. And that's before we even talk about the fact that if you don't have a good healthcare system, uh, like in America, where you don't have access to free healthcare, you have to go out to work even if you have symptoms. So it makes it much harder to control the pandemic. I just put this in as a figure that comes up a lot in global health talks showing uh, the causes of death. And the relevance is that, that many of these, if we look at pertussis, meningitis, uh, measles, diarrhea, pneumonia, are all preventable by vaccines. Um, and there's a real concern of the impact on vaccine delivery during the pandemic. Um, so again, some data from UNICEF showing how many children are going to miss out on measles. Um, and there's also a concern about a polio outbreak in Pakistan. And then this data that for every COVID-19 death that you prevent, um, due to keeping people away from the clinic, one deaths in children could be prevented by giving the vaccine. Um, and so I was talking to a colleague who works in Zimbabwe, they think that 65% of routine immunizations and antenatal clinic visits have been missed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a really alarming figure. Anyway, sorry, just segue there. Um, and so this is just a summary of what we thought would happen with COVID-19 in children, that there'd be low numbers of cases and that have majority would have asymptomatic and mild disease and we wouldn't see greater illness. We weren't, I, I wasn't really prepared, I think, for the impact on poverty and development and education and vaccine delivery, but that's been a huge concern and a growing concern, I think. Um, but actually from an, a local perspective and an immunology perspective, there were lots of early questions about why COVID-19 was less common and less severe in children. And perhaps children are a really good group to study to try and understand correlates of immune protection, uh, to, which have impacts for vaccine development, potential immune modulatory therapies and things like that. So I think this is probably where we were in about mid April, that we need to look at all these kids with mild disease to understand why they were different to the adults. And then something else happened. So I'm just going to very briefly present a case of a child who presented uh, to us at the end of April. She's an 11 year old girl who came to her local hospital with a three day history of fever, abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, myalgia and neck swelling, which is a kind of thing that a lot of these kids had. Um, she was tachycardic and hot and her initial bloods showed a CRP of 150, raised D-dimers, a number I'm coming to hate, um, and very lymphopenic and her platelets were low and over the next 24 hours these deteriorated. Interestingly, she did have a positive um, PCR swab for SARS-CoV-2, but because her abdomen, abdominal pain was a predominant feature, she underwent surgical review at her local and had an ultrasound abdomen and a CT of her abdomen which just showed thickened walls and evidence of inflammation and so the working diagnosis was did she have an abdominal focus for sepsis was she a ruptured appendix or something like that um, did she just actually was she a young person presenting with severe COVID-19 there have been a spattering of adolescents who've presented with an adult-like picture other things like toxic shock were kind of considered but she wasn't red or inflamed at that time and so she was started in antibiotics um, but unfortunately, over a very short period of time, she had a, a really severe deterioration. She required 16 months per kilo of fluid and was transferred with CATS to our intensive care here, where she was on noradrenaline, adrenaline and milrinone. Um, um, with actually really quite saggy blood pressure despite three inotropes. Um, so we instituted some IVIG and her echo showed severe ventricular dysfunction um, and she had refractory hypotension and on repeat bloods her troponin jumped to 2500. So she was transferred to Greater Ormond Street for ECMO because we were struggling to maintain her blood pressure um, and she had 16 days of ECMO and was treated with really high doses of uh, steroids. Um, and what's just of note from the biopsy when they put the cannula into her heart, she had a lymphocytic myocarditis. Um, and I'm told reliably that it's normally a neutrophilic myocarditis that we see in children who present with myocarditis. And this possibly explains where all the lymphocytes which uh, are not in the blood are hiding. And thankfully, she had a really good outcome. She was extubated. She had some initial critical care myopathy, um, but maintained her cognition and she re covered her ventricular function and made a good recovery. She's at home, she's got some ongoing issues with them um, swallowing and some speech and language issues, but is actually generally doing very well. So I just put this, this case in just to highlight or illustrate the kind of severe end of the spectrum of this new emerging thing that we were starting to see. And so what happened was, um, and the reason this kind of came out was that there were three children admitted with shock from Woolwich in a, in a 24 hour period. And the Evelina Children's Hospital put an alert out um, through PHE 
Um, I think at the time there was a question, could there be a cluster of group A strep? But actually when it was looked into, these children were of different ages, didn't have any family contacts, went to different schools. Um, but over, and, and Julia Kenny, who's a colleague, contacted me to say, oh, have you seen any kids like this? Um, and in the next 24 hours at Great Ormond Street, three children from East London and from Essex were admitted with a very similar picture. Um, and actually on our ward in intensive care, we had our girl and a couple of other children who were not dissimilar. Um, and so we got in touch with NHS England um, as a group and the Pediatric Intensive Care Society um, put out a survey to the intensive care units and, and we identified a cohort of 19 children in a week, 12 of whom were in London who had presented it this way. Um, and so we issued the NHS England alert that caused quite a media foray um, and led us to do a case definition. So these children um, have been presenting with fever um, and rash and conjunctivitis, you know, a little bit like some of the muc mucocutaneous features of Kawasaki disease. They often have abdominal pain and diarrhea um, and maybe headaches, a bit like the girl that I told you about. Um, and what was quite concerning um, and marked in the cohort that we initially saw was they had profound shock. Um, so they had significant myocardial dysfunction um, with raised troponins and um, BMP. Um, they had ECG abnormalities and arrhythmias at about 20%. Um, and really concerningly is that some of these children were had coronary artery dilatation. So there were two children who had giant coronary arteries uh, with set scores of greater than 10. And in addition, they have this really marked bowel inflammation. So there's a separate publication from Great Women's Street of eight children who presented for laparotomy who actually turned out to probably have PIMS and required IVIG and steroids to turn off their inflammation, but had no real findings um, at surgery. Um, and then their blood picture was really similar to what we saw in adults with severe COVID-19. So they have really profoundly low lymphocyte counts, really high uh, neutrophils and CRP. They're quite sick, so their albumin have dropped a lot. And then they've got um, disorders of coagulation and evidence of endothelial damage with high fibrinogen and high D-dimers. And then really worryingly that, as I mentioned, the high troponin and BNP. But unlike our girl, the majority of the patients that we saw and that have been seen national, internationally have had a negative swab for SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, however, the majority have a positive IgG test. And this kind of starts to lead us to where, what is the pathogenesis and what's causing this condition. And this is just a figure showing you in green here, um, the number of admissions to intensive care um, uh, over the April, end of April, May period. So we would have anticipated the number in purple, but this is what was happening with PIMS, and this is in 21 intensive care units around the country. And shortly after we issued our alert, um, a number of uh, European countries followed suit um, in Italy, Spain, and France, and some of the countries where they'd had really high outbreaks of COVID-19. Um, and uh, there were 17 publications in four weeks um, on this topic. Um, and we, uh, uh, with colleagues, uh, wrote a definition with the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health that describing those clinical features and lab features I talked about, um, it's saying that it's really important to exclude an underlying bacterial infection. Um, and also in our definition, we said that there may, you may not, you don't have to have evidence of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the CDC issued um, about three weeks later their definition. It's quite similar, except for you do have to have evidence of SARS-CoV-2, which is more or less the only difference. Um, just to go through the epidemiology, um, these, it's very similar to what the adults have seen, which is that there's a male predominance, that there's a black and ethnic minority predominance, although this has started to even out a bit as we get more numbers and it looks um, uh, a little bit less like it's um, maybe genetically linked. And I think there's lots of questions about whether this is just because um, this, uh, these ethnicities and have a lower um, socioeconomic status. And unfortunately, this is probably a disease of poverty and reflects where viral replication is happening. And the median age for these kids is nine years. So in our paper, um, we described three main phenotypes. So there's this group of shock that I, like the girl I presented, um, which make up about 50 or perhaps a bit higher in some of the American cohorts, they would go to 60 or 70%. Um, these kids are about a median age of 10. Um, they often have abdominal features. They are marked inflammation and concerningly high cardiac enzymes and frequently have evidence of ventricular dysfunction um, and coronary artery aneurysms. And a number of these kids have required two or more treatments to improve. Although what's really noteworthy is that some of the children identified who presented in April got better without any treatment at all. Um, 
Three children required ECMO. And unfortunately, one child died. Um, and that's the only death that we've had in the UK cohort. Um, and then we described this group of children who had a Kawasaki-like disease, but they had a median age of eight, which is older than we'd normally see with Kawasaki. And we called them this because they clinically met the American Heart Association criteria of having four or five muc mucocutaneous features. Um, again, they have inflammation, but it's a little bit less common for this cohort to have ventricular dysfunction. And they were managed as though they had Kawasaki and none of them required ECMO or died. And then we're left with this other group who have kind of got a non-specific inflammation. So we call them febrile and inflammatory, um, and similar median age. And they just basically don't meet the other two criteria, but they can have some evidence of um, tachycardia and hypertension, but not requiring large fluid boluses or inotropes. And they um, often have abdominal pain or diarrhea, and they may have some mucocutaneous features, but not enough to meet the American Heart Association criteria. Um, and again, marked inflammation. And some of these kids have ventricular dysfunction. And concerningly, we did see coronary artery aneurysms in this cohort. Um, and again, some of them just got better by themselves. Um, I just put this in, this is from a New England Journal paper that was published last week. Um, and they did a lovely thing, which is where they um, looked at the symptoms by age. And I just think it's quite interesting that in the younger age group, they were much more likely to present with a Kawasaki-like picture. And I think it's not improbable that amongst the cohort, we would just pick up children who were presenting with Kawasaki during a pandemic. Um, and then interestingly, as you get a bit older, we see more of the gastro, um, so the gastro symptoms and then the myocarditis was more common in the older children, but did occur. All of the symptoms occurred in children of all ages. Um, again, from uh, one of the New England Journal papers um, showing very similar to what we saw, this is just looking at cardiovascular involvement because it presents it really prettily in a graph. It's uh, nicer than my own slide, so I use it. Um, so about 80% of kids um, have any cardiovascular involvement and about 50% have um, increased cardiac enzymes or require inotropes. This is very similar to what we saw. And then they've broken down into kind of how the ejection fraction is affected. We saw quite a few children who had pericardial effusions as well. Hard to know how much of that is related to fluid resuscitation. Um, and again, very low rates of ECMO in the American cohort as well. So what is the mechanism of this condition? And, you know, is it antibody mediated? Is it immune complex? Are we just describing Kawasaki disease during a pandemic? Um, there are other similar conditions that have been described in children um, like Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki disease with shock um, or toxic shock syndrome. And then things like hemophagocytic lymphocytic histiocytosis and macrophage activation syndromes have some similarities, but actually are, are quite distinct. So, and we haven't compared them. So we were very fortunate to have access to um, a big data set from San Diego, from Jane Burns, um, who very kindly shared um, in details on Kawasaki disease and Kawasaki disease with shock and from the Euclid and Perform cohorts and from Mike Levine's group. And we had a group of children who had toxic shock syndrome. Just a reminder of what Kawasaki disease is. Um, so it's a vasculitis of childhood presenting with red eyes, red lips and a red tongue and often a red rash. These children have lymphadenopathy and they often have swollen hands and feet. And then at the later stage, they get peeling of the hands and feet. And Kawasaki shock syndrome is quite similar to Kawasaki disease, except for they also have um, shock. Um, so they can present with GI symptoms like the PIMS kids, um, and they uh, can also have uh, cardiovascular dysfunction like the PIMS kids. So I guess some people have questioned whether PIMS is just Kawasaki shock syndrome, um, uh, but the blood picture is not the same. But again, like all of these things, they have those risk of coronary artery aneurysm. This is a figure from a French paper, um, which I thought was quite nice, that just shows the differences in, in presentation of children with Kawasaki disease, which is what's seen in red here, and then the symptoms of PIMS that don't overlap with Kawasaki. So in their cohort, they saw about 30% of children had neurological signs. Um, a number of our kids had confusion, but we felt that was related to shock rather than necessarily being CNS involvement. About a third have respiratory signs. So we probably saw a similar number with abnormal chest x-rays, again, though often representing fluid overload, um, but also some children having ground glass changes consistent with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and then in the cardiac involvement showing just much a higher rate. And in France, they had a really high rate of ECMO. Um, um, whether they had a different phenotype of children, whether it was a late presentation or whether they are earlier to move to ECMO than we do, I'm not quite sure. And again, this uh, gastrointestinal involvement is very different in the PIMS cohort than it is in children with Kawasaki disease. 
Um, so this is from our paper, um, and what I'm showing you here is a comparison between the PIMS cohort, children with Kawasaki disease, children with Kawasaki disease with shock, and children with toxic shock syndrome. Um, and what you can see is that these kids are substantially older than the children in the other cohorts. And um, that will be our experience. We see tend to see Kawasaki disease in younger children, um, that they were more inflamed, so much higher neutrophils, CRP, and ferritin. And then when we look at their FBC, they were lymphopenic, anemic, and thrombocytopenic. So we often see high platelets actually in Kawasaki disease. So this is quite a different picture. Um, and very severely unwell, so the albumins tended to be quite low, and whether that's due to permeability of membranes. And then the other thing um, that we found was that their cardiac enzymes were raised. Um, uh, not all children have their cardiac enzymes measured, um, and there is a nice piece of work being done by our intensive care colleagues looking at troponin in children prior to the COVID outbreak. Um, because of the differences in the definition in America and the WHO, the CDC and WHO guidelines to the college guidelines, we had a look to see if whether or not you had a SARS-CoV-2 um, and had evidence of SARS-CoV-2 or not made a difference. And we compared those children um, who had no uh, confirmed PCR or serology with those who did um, and showed that there were no different significant differences in any of the markers that we looked at. And then finally, and really importantly, we really wanted to know whether you could predict which children would develop coronary artery aneurysms. Um, and so we um, pulled out the children who, in our cohort, there were eight who had coronary artery aneurysms and looked at, again, all those markers that are easily available to a clinician to see if we could predict it. And unfortunately, um, it wasn't possible to do so based on all of the other markers that we looked at. So this was concerning because um, it has implications in terms of how you manage children. So in summary, just talking about PIMS, this appears to be distinct um, on uh, clinical and laboratory markers from Kawasaki disease, Kawasaki disease with shock or toxic shock syndrome, um, that having evidence of infection doesn't seem to make a difference. Um, I didn't put this in, but actually those children who were shocked and had inotropic support um, had much more profound um, inflammation um, on their CRP, ferritin, and things like that, um, and also had very, more likely to have raised cardiac enzymes. So that could be useful, um, but that we cannot predict those who'll get coronary artery aneurysms. And so what are the implications of this? So we've been treating this cohort with the same treatment that we use for Kawasaki disease, but I've just told you that this is a different and, and distinct emerging syndrome. So perhaps we can't really assume that Kawasaki disease treatments are going to work. Um, we know that shock is a more, more severe phenotype. So can we use this information to direct treatment and location of care? So those children who present with a really severe picture probably ought to be close to an intensive care unit and probably ought to have early immune modulation. Um, uh, but we cannot predict whether coronary artery aneurysms will uh, develop based on presentation of lab results. And this has been the case in the Kawasaki community as well, which is why all children who present with Kawasaki get treated. But it does then mean, do we need to follow up and do an echo on all children who present with a persistent febrile illness during a, during a COVID-19 outbreak? This has huge implications for service delivery. And our cardiology colleagues have been really uh, amenable and flexible about doing these uh, echoes, but it, it, we need to understand whether we need to continue doing them up to six weeks like we do in Kawasaki for all children. So and it brings us back to the mechanism. So is what is the mechanism? What do we know already? So this is from uh, Albert F.A. in The Lancet recently. Um, he went back, uh, the French group went back and looked at Kawasaki disease um, over the last uh, 14 years um, and showed that there was an outbreak in this Kawasaki, they call it Kawashock, which is quite fun, um, but I'm going to stick with PIMS. Um, so this outbreak uh, that we've described, uh, but interestingly with about back, they also saw an outbreak associated with swine flu. And this is quite interesting to try and hypothesize um, what, what the difference, what's happening here is this like a, a viral interferon driven process in children. Um, is it because of genetic predisposition or what's causing it? Um, uh, there's also uh, uh, this temporal association that I described. So this in orange shows you the peak of cases in Europe and admissions, which was happening uh, towards the beginning of April. And in the bar charts, you can see when all of the um, PIMS cases were happening. So this is happening four to six weeks later. Um, the Americans describe it as happening as close as two weeks later, but I think that in our experience, it was happening a bit later. There have been some people who have proposed 
Um, that's not surprising um, if, as I said at the beginning, this virus is handed on from parents to children, there might be a lag in children presenting. And I think that might account for there being a two week lag. But I think when we talk to families and we know that there's been a definite case, so if, for example, we've had children whose fathers have been in intensive care and they're definitely presenting five to six weeks later. So I think four to five weeks is probably a reasonable um, uh, number to use. And then to just go back to what's happening, the pattern of disease in adults, um, where um, this is the classic thing that happens. You have a viral response phase where people are very viremic at the beginning and possibly even before they're symptomatic, which is why it's so hard to contain um, because telling people to stay at home once they feel unwell means you miss those two days before they feel unwell. Um, and then most people clear the virus and, and then those who have severe disease present with respiratory illness. And then what we've seen in adults is that there's a later hyperinflammatory phase, which is causing the cytokine storm. And I think what we think in children is that actually this, what we're seeing is happening even later. So this is just another way of seeing it. So that's the same thing here. And this little dotted line at the bottom is this very mild disease we see in children. And then finally, this little blip of multi-system inflammatory syndrome. I think this is from a, an adult paper again there that I've shipped the reference at the bottom um, and the blip is very tiny. And I think that is the thing to take away as I am describing something that's very rare. Um, this is just to show you that um, this is a paper that was in the Lancet. It's a very small number of cases, but showing that there is viral, um, direct viral infection of the endothelium. Um, and I talked earlier about the importance of a, a preserved endothelium um, in, in children, perhaps protecting them from having severe disease. And it does raise an interesting question as to, is, is there a subgroup of children who um, ex perhaps have different receptors on their endothelium um, and that the, this may actually be a viral replication process that's happening in the gut or the heart, where we haven't really looked for the virus. So most of the testing we do, we say we don't find the virus is in the upper respiratory tract, um, but the children may well have cleared it from there and it may be causing problems elsewhere. In the one child in our setting who had a post-mortem and therefore had biopsies of um, and looked for the virus in, in all of his tissue, it wasn't found anywhere else. Um, but N equals one is always a difficult place to work from. Um, we, the children who had abdominal surgery and have had samples sent to the lab, I think they haven't identified the virus in any of those. Um, and our colleagues across the water have looked in stool in a large cohort of these children with PIMS and haven't identified the virus there either. Um, and so I think that um, it may be more that the virus infects the endothelium and then triggers an inflammatory response there that leads to problems. This is a picture which I just put in from another review article talking about what normally happens in children, that they just get a little bit of nasopharyngeal colonization and mild infection and then clear it. Um, and maybe that's because they don't have the ACE receptors or maybe just because they're always seeing viruses, there's really good innate responses in that area. And then this is that what happens, macrophages, T cells, antibodies, um, and cytokine release. And maybe if you have this genetic predisposition, you go on to get PIMS or MIS-C is what they call it in the US. Um, and I think the genetic predisposition question is really interesting, um, but Kawasaki disease is called Kawasaki because Mr. Kawasaki or Dr. Kawasaki from Japan. And we know that the um, in, a, in Asian communities in, in Singapore and South Korea and Japan, they have much higher incidence of Kawasaki disease, which is presumably related to a genetic predisposition. Um, and perhaps there's a different genetic predisposition to a cousin of Kawasaki or PIMS, which is a distinct thing, but there may be something going on. And in Kawasaki, we know that there are a variety of um, gene, um, genes involved um, in B cells and class switching and immunoglobulin, which comes back to that, is it antibody mediated question? Um, and Helen Payne prepared this slide yesterday for our journal club, um, going back and looking at this paper of Chinese children in March, and she highlighted that actually 30% of those kids had elevated myocardial enzymes. So it's quite interesting that although um, talking to colleagues in Asia, they have not described a single case of PIMS or MIS-C, and they haven't seen an increase in Kawasaki disease or toxic shock. Um, but it may be that there is a milder phenotype of it happening there, um, or maybe these were just children who had severe COVID-19 disease, but it's really interesting to hypothesize about genetic differences. There may also be a numbers game that the number of children in the traditionally um, uh, places like Japan and South Korea, where they normally have a lot of Kawasaki, there are very few children were infected and you have to have a, a very large number of children infected to see a rare side effect. Um, I've just put this in. So the spike protein is this lobular bit on the outside of the virus, and people um, have hypothesized that uh, antibody to spike 
may cause macrophage activation and cause some of the severe lung disease in adults. Um, and uh, there is some suggestion that this may also um, be relevant um, for the pathogenesis of PIMS. Um, but again, uh, further work is required. And then this uh, paper in Nature Reviews suggested that perhaps um, the, in children, we are just seeing the cytokine storm that we see in adults a bit later because children have different interferon responses to adults. Um, but again, this is hypothesis driven. And I think uh, like all good talks, I'm gonna end by saying we need more research. Um, this is some data from um, our group, from the group here at Imperial from, um, uh, from 2000s. Um, looking at interleukin-6 in children with meningococcal septic shock who, as you know, have quite significant myocardial dysfunction um, and showing that there is a direct relationship between IL-6 levels and myocardial dysfunction in these children. It's really interesting because IL-6... Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, is the cytokine that leads to increased levels of CRP. Um, and tocilizumab is an anti-IL-6 uh, receptor antibody. And so there is a question about whether this might be the IL treatment, ideal treatment for PIMS-TS. And there has been one very small case report of four children who had Kawasaki, two of whom were given tocilizumab, both developed coronary artery aneurysms, which leads to some disquiet in the Kawasaki community about using tocilizumab in these children. Um, however, I think um, in, in the older children who have this distinct emerging phenomenon, which is similar to Kawasaki, it may be an ideal treatment of choice. And that just brings us to what we are doing from a treatment perspective. I mean, uh, we are basing things on anecdata and instinct and an expert opinion rather than any evidence. And, and just of note, about 13 of the children of 58 in our cohort had no treatment at all. Um, and then others had a combination of treatments that we use for Kawasaki and other inflammatory processes. So intravenous immunoglobulin, steroids, plus or minus biologics um, used in a variety of combinations. And this is a figure from a paper coming out about um, uh, treatment use in PICU um, in the UK um, over the time period of the pandemic, just showing that at the beginning, children maybe got one treatment, but by the time we were in the middle of it all, all children were getting pretty much everything. Um, and this is a really fascinating look at our behavior as clinicians, um, I think, because we have no evidence that giving all the treatments at once makes any difference, but because we have this handful of children requiring ECMO in that one death, there was a huge concern about trying to avoid those outcomes and therefore we we're a bit more aggressive with the treatment than, than we needed, than we knew whether or not that was the right thing to do. So we, we did draw up this um, treatment pathway um, for London. There has been a Delphi process as well that should be published soon, just saying that if children present with shock, um, they should probably be treated early, making sure we're covering with clindamycin for toxic shock. If they look like they've got Kawasaki disease, they should be managed as though they have Kawasaki disease. And then the group that gives us the biggest headache are those who don't quite fit the criteria, that febrile and inflammatory group I described. Um, and so we're kind of making treatment decisions with the multidisciplinary team and considering all agents. But we're putting all of these kids on aspirin for its benefit and in particular the older children we're considering the use of low molecular weight heparin and um, they have quite profoundly abnormal fibrinogen and d-dimers um, and there have been a couple of children who presented with severe thrombosis but not in the numbers that we've seen in adults with COVID-19. Um, and then uh, the Mike and uh, the group here at Imperial have developed the best available treatment study or BATS um, uh, which is based on the supposition that we have um, this is new um, phenomenon um, and there is some pediatric experience in using IVIG and steroids for Kawasaki but COVID-19 we don't know if it's the same thing in adults they've got increasing experience of using a number of biologics with good effect um, there are some outcomes we can measure um, and although this is an observational treatment study, it's basically in effect what we're asking clinicians to do globally is to um, input data about their patients into an international database so that we can use a variety of complex machine learning techniques to analyze the data and look to see which treatments are most effective or whether there is no difference in which treatment you use, you just need to turn it off. It's all anonymized and um, open. Anybody who takes part can be part of that study group. Um, and so this is open at the moment. And I think that we have 23 countries who've already put data in. Um, and so hopefully this will give us some really useful information about what treatments are best to use. Um, in addition, the recovery trial um, has been, we've got permission from the um, 
lead investigators to basically turn the paediatric arm into something that's useful for PIMSTS. Um, so we have changed the uh, outcomes and the endpoints to fit um, PIMSTS to gather appropriate data about the same outcomes we're talking here, with coronary artery aneurysms and duration of hospital stay and things. Um, and so hopefully we can start to use that and to do a little bit of randomization so we will include things. And then we're also trying to develop a randomized controlled trial looking at IVIG versus steroids and then the biologics. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we're not going to need this, but if there is a second surge, then there may well be another large group of children presenting um, with PIMS in the autumn or in early 2021. And I guess we just have to watch the space. The optimist in me hopes I'll spend too much time and energy working on this and never need to use it. Um, and I just thought this is very early outcome data from our colleagues um, in cardiology at the Brompton. Thank you for sharing. Um, so we had uh, 35 patients and they were 20% uh, looked like they had Kawasaki, 14% were shocked and 66% were febrile and inflammatory. And at presentation, nine had ventricular dysfunction and seven had abnormal cardiac enzymes and 12 had coronary abnormalities at presentation. But reassuringly, by follow-up, um, all blood markers had resolved. Um, 33 of the 35 children had um, normal myocardial function, and five of the children had persistent mild coronary ectasia, but not significant aneurysms. So I think this may suggest that in these children, um, although there may be profound abnormalities at presentation, it does recover. Um, but this is very early outcome data. We don't have the entire cohort. Uh, we do know that some children have been readmitted um, with uh, recurrence of symptoms uh, five or six weeks out of the Evelina. Um, and we just don't know what the outcomes will be for these children. So it's really crucial that we follow them up. So we're left with lots of unknowns. We don't know what causes this. We don't know what risk factors there are to develop it. We're still learning about the pathophysiology. We don't really know what the long-term outcomes are. And then importantly, we don't know what the implications are for vaccine development and convalescent plasma, because if this is antibody mediated um, and a vaccine um, triggers the production of antibodies, are we potentially, our children potentially at risk? Um, so I showed you that pathogenesis figure at the beginning, showing that if you had neutralizing antibodies, then you had a, a, you know, a, a measured immune response and you didn't end up with severe disease. And that, that is what the vaccines that are being produced are aiming to produce vaccines that are candidates that are being tested are aiming to produce neutralizing antibodies rather than non-neutralizing antibodies which are the ones which are much more likely to lead to antibody dependent enhancement and problems like that but also we don't know what's in convalescent plasma so we test the IgG but we don't know if there are other antibodies this is often convalescent plasma from people who've been unwell and so perhaps they don't have the right type of antibodies I think that caution needs to be used um, when introducing these things um, uh, particularly in a pediatric setting but I think also can studying children help to give us some information about the adults who have COVID-19 this is quite a distinct group of children um, we're really fortunate to have such great studies as Diamonds, um, which is open across Europe and the UK, um, which can gather data on these children. And there are similar studies going on in America. But because you can really see these children, they stand out from the rest of the crowd in a pediatric population. It is possibly easier to study them than to try and look at the phenotypes of a huge number of adults. And I'm going to end there. Um, so thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Just remember, if you're working and uh, any of our cities are open, please recruit your children. Thank you. Hello. Stunned silence. Thanks, Liz. That's a, Andy Bush here. That's a really, really great talk. And it's really interesting to think everybody's sort of peddling getting the anti getting antibodies into the patients as a w as a way of treating them. But the challenge, as you rightly say, could it be actually be making them worse? Hence the need for the, hence the need for really proper trials and get the data rather than as um, infectious diseases consultants are not the only one. If there's a treatment and the child's sick, I'm going to give it whether I know whether it's any use or not. We really do need those data, and it's great to see it being being put together. Thanks, Wendy. Lots of people saying thank you. Question, <laughs> questions are really great opportunity. It's a fantastic talk, really great opportunity to interrogate one of the world's experts in this subject. Oh, I've never been a world expert in anything. It's exciting. <laughs>
Um, it's because I talk so fast, everyone's still catching up. Well, if, if anybody's got a question, either chat, put, stick it in the chat room or ask Liz. Um, while people are thinking, just remember ne ne next week's talk at same same time uh, is sudden tail on neonatal encephalopathy. Uh, we've got a program till the end of July, uh, and then we'll have a break in August and restart. So there's a question that can you see the chat yeah. yourself? Do you want to take those oh, questions? Claire, so Claire, we've written a patient information leaflet, which um, uh, we can share. Um, I have. Um, it, I, I must check that it's gone through. It went through our guidelines committee, and I'll make sure that it's going up on the intranet. Um, but I, I will also. We also need. To, I've given it to one of the CNSs at the Brompton. So we're doing a follow-up clinic. We go over to the Brompton on a Wednesday and a Thursday to follow up these clinic these children, and where they're having their echoes. So we can also um, support them there. It's been. I have to say the one thing about this um, whole thing. COVID and PIMS has been the extraordinary collaboration across sites, and um, both locally in Northwest London, but also at a national and international level. Um, but Claire, I, I will make sure it's on the internet, and if not, I'll bring it down to a &E. And in answer to this, all the talks are recorded. They're all available online so that you can access them late, uh, later on. Um, Nicola, I'm sure, will be happy to circulate the link to it to everybody. But yes, do please and pass it on. Anybody is welcome to access these talks and educate themselves, as I've been educated by them. Definitely, Andy. I'll make sure that the link goes round again, and I'm just trying to access it now so I can copy it into the chat. So if people are keen to have it right now, if you hang on for one minute, I will copy and paste it into the chat so you've got it um, right now. Great. And I think in the announcements that go round, it's also it's also there. Do encourage people to access it because I know there's no perfect time. I know there's clashes with handovers and stuff like that. There is no perfect time that suits everybody, but this is the best compromise with it available online. Okay, lovely. I'm going to go back to the ward. Well, I've got three TB patients. It's very exciting for me to go to a world that I'm more familiar with. <laughs> Um, Thank you very much indeed for a really great talk and taking the time out to do that. Right. Um, the, for those, the, the link is, Nicola has just put the link on the, to access all the talks on, in, the ch in the chat. Uh, Liz, th thanks again for a really, really fascinating talk. Speak soon. Talk soon. Bye.